this is a test. EA Sports. It's in the game.
Good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night Worship. Uh, just a few announcements as you guys are coming in and finding your seats. Um, just a reminder to check in if you haven't done so already, um, either on your phone or as the tablets are being passed around. Uh, please do that. It lets us know that you are here. Um, and if you're new, we want to get connected with you. So, uh, If you guys served at the banquet this past weekend, thank you guys so much um, for serving. That is such a big event for us. Um, and we really appreciate your guys' help in that um, and, and being around and, and a part of that and inviting your friends and family um, to be a part of that too. Um, just an update on our, our giving, our fundraising uh, for the new deck and patio. We are at 45,000 out of 50. So <laughs> yes, uh, very exciting, very exciting. Um, that's all I have. I want to invite Heidi up to share something. Hi, guys. Real quick, I just want to talk to you guys. You guys might have received emails in the past couple weeks um, just talking about student government applications are open. I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about that. Um, if you've been in student government before, can you stand up at any point? Good. So you guys just see these people. Just make a mental note. That's all. You guys can sit down. Um, so I just think I'm in student government this year. It's my second year, and I plan on doing it again next year. Um, it's a really cool opportunity to serve campus and serve your peers, and I think that all of us should be having an avenue to serve at most points in our life. Um, it's also a really cool opportunity to make a difference on campus. When we have Christian people in leadership roles at Trine, really cool things can happen, and we can help push for things um, or kind of also discourage other things. Um, so if you want to have a hand in, like, decisions that are being made with faculty, with staff, even in relation to the president. This is just a really cool opportunity um, to just kind of join the leadership of Trine and choose to make sure that doors for Christianity stay open. Um, also, if you see things on campus that you want to improve, from silly things of like, I want an ice machine in my dorm, to like, I want to start a club to transform Hershey Hall, right? Like, this is a way to do that, and this is a way to like, make big changes on campus, as you have a lot more communication with faculty and staff. Um, it does take some time, as we do have like, weekly meetings, um, but I have just found it super encouraging, just getting to meet with people that would never step foot in these doors, and just get to have a positive influence on them, so... Next year, we're going to have a lot of open spots with a lot of seniors leaving, and there's going to be a lot of roles that just aren't being filled by anyone. Um, so if you're interested in this, this sounds like something you want to do, come talk to me or one of the people that stood up. It's just a really cool opportunity to um, take leadership and um, just see, get to, like, encourage where the university is going. So, yeah, that's all. Hello. Hello. Yep. Thanks for sharing with us, Heidi. I definitely encourage you to go talk to any of them if you're interested or just curious. Um, I'm so excited to worship together tonight, and I just want to invite you all to worship um, with us. That can be standing, that can be sitting or kneeling, but I just really want to um, express that with these songs, there are new songs a lot of you have seen, um, that you can just digest and spend this time with the Lord um, in different ways, whether that's singing or praying or journaling or just standing and listening to the words. Um, any of those things are worthy of um, worship for the Lord. He loves all of those things, and all of those are ways of praising him. So I just want to invite you to worship with us tonight. Here we stand on this foundation, hope as an anchor, faith is our flag, the cross is our courage, your word is our way. Through wars and rumors of wars, still you are 
sovereign, still you are, Lord, above the confusion, your covenant stands, for you have not, not for a moment, abandoned your promise to save, and you will not, not for a moment, withdraw your Almighty to save. Yes, our God is ever almighty, ever almighty always. Here and now, stone upon stone, the house you are building, a people your own, your kingdom unshaped. Oh uh -huh. 
How I live for the moments where I'm still in your presence. All noise dies down. Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new, and so I surrender all. All I want is to live within your love, be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of in my bones there is no hesitation in your love and affection it's the sweetest of all Lord I know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something new and so I surrender Desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Whoa. Yeah. 
good to be here. Um, we are in the second week of our relationship series. Um, my name's Ike Sheehan. If you don't know me, if you do know me, uh, well, then you knew who was probably going to be preaching on the dating week. And um, yeah, I, I guess to start off, really, I should, I should share with you guys that I started dating my now fiance, Kate Gardner, um, around this time last year. And we're getting married uh, this summer. So I just went through this whole dating process, and uh, Kate and I can proudly say that we feel like we've done the dating thing pretty well. And I'm going to give examples that are personal to Kate and I throughout this sermon. So more than just the personal examples, I hope to actually give you some biblical uh, concepts and guidelines uh, to help uh, you have a, have a Christian perspective on dating. And so in order to talk about dating, actually, and Christian dating, I want to first draw our, t our attention and our allegiance to Christ and his teachings, because I need to make sure that those of you who are listening to this um, 
you aren't just listening, wanting to add a few new things to how you already see fit to, to date people. I, I want you to listen to this, listening for what Jesus and the rest of the Bible uh, teach about dealing with the opposite sex in the context of a dating relationship. And so I don't want to. I don't want to stand up here and just uh, improve upon whatever methodology you see fit. I I want to come up here and I want to talk about submitting to Christ, submitting your romantic interests, submitting um, your sexual desires, the way that you treat the opposite sex, and every other aspect of our lives to Christ. Um, and so if you're expecting some some cute cliches to you know add to your repertoire of those, I'm sorry, you're not going to get those. But we will have fun in this topic, but not because it's not a serious topic. This is actually a really serious topic. Um, it, it can have a profound effect on your life. And so I, wa I want to first talk about the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ before I get into dating and, and Christian dating. If we're going to put Christian in front of dating, we need to know what it means to be a Christian first. And so if you guys want to be Christians, let's talk about dating as a Christian. So it should look different than how the world dates. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I have to first ask you if you're willing to lose your life for Christ's sake. And I want us to all understand the cost of following Jesus. Unlike what we often think in America, following Jesus is dying to ourselves, and uh, it might cost us everything or at least everything that the world tells us we should do or want. Um, because Paul says in Galatians 5, right before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he talks about how the flesh wants what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit wants what's contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict. And so therefore, um, who are we going to let influence us and inform us on how we should date? Are we going to let our flesh in the world dictate that, or are we going to let the Spirit of God influence that? I want to ask you, do you actually, do you sitting here in the seat, do you actually want to bring your uh, dating relationship, your love life, under the reins of Christ and his authority, or do you just want to do what you want to do? I need to ask you that, and I need to, I need to, to spell out a couple things uh, from scripture here. Judges 17, 6 um, from the Old Testament. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Proverbs uh, 26 12, do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for them. Um, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I, when I was younger, I was wise in my own eyes, and I just did whatever I saw fit. And that goes for more than just dating. Uh, that goes for everything. And I, I never really asked for advice. I never thought I needed to ask for advice. What did I need to ask for advice for? I knew everything when I was in high school, right? And maybe some of you aren't really too far removed from that. Maybe you still feel that way. And um, you never have it all figured out. But I wish I would have asked advice from godly counsel and from the Bible. Um, I had a girlfriend in high school for several years, actually, and I didn't see that relationship as an opportunity to ask for advice on how to date. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that that even warranted the necessity to ask for uh, advice. And looking back on that, I did what was right in my own eyes, and that relationship, it didn't honor the Lord. And... I've learned a lot from it, but unfortunately, it's from mistakes that I made in that relationship. And unfortunately, uh, those mistakes still affect both me and the person that I was in the relationship with. And that's why the topic of dating is so important. Okay. And so I want to take us to another passage. Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The bar is set that high if you're a Christian and you believe Jesus' words, okay? And we don't lower the standard for couples who are dating, right? There's not an addendum at the end of that verse that says, except if she's your girlfriend, then it's okay, right? They're, they're, that's not at the end of the verse. You can, you can go look at the footnotes. Um, it's not my job to talk about sex this week. We're going to be talking about sex next week. Um, but I, for the purpose of this sermon, I do need to at least address it. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible um, about dating as we know it. Um, dating is a fairly new thing, but there are general principles in the Bible that spell out uh, things that we should follow uh, regarding relations with the opposite sex. And there's, the Bible talks about there being a marriage covenant between one man and one woman, and that covenantal relationship is the only place um, in which God intends for sexual intercourse to take place. There is no place 
in the biblical worldview for sex outside of marriage. Now, sex is a good thing. God made it. And just like anything else, it's great for what it's intended for, which is intimacy between a, a married man and a married woman. But just like anything, you use it outside of the intended use of it. And not only is it bad for that thing, but it actually probably harms the user of it. So sex is just like that. Now, moving forward, let's, ta- let, let, let's look at something else Jesus says about uh, dealing with sin in our life. Uh, Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have both your eyes and be thrown into hell. Now, do you realize the, the implications of this? this? This verse should tell us how even though Jesus was a very merciful man towards sinners and he loved sinners, he wants us to stop at nothing to not sin, to avoid sin, do anything. And I once again ask you, do you really want to bring your love life into uh, the authority of Christ and under his reign? Or do you just want to do what you want to do? Now, I talked a little bit about marriage, about sex. I've set some things in place. We've talked about following Christ. Let's get to, let's get to dating. What, what is this whole thing of dating, right? Let's ask the big question. What's it, what's it for? What is the purpose of dating? Uh, you, you can write this down. Write this down. Dating is for evaluating a potential spouse. And that implies that you should only date people that you have prayerfully decided you think you could see yourself marrying. And I do mean that. Now, let me explain some very intentional words that I use in that. Um, Evaluating. I use the word evaluate. Dating is a process that you move through. It's not just a, a status that you just stay in. Okay. So, during this time that you're evaluating someone else, you actually are deciding whether or not you want to marry this person. And so once you've made that decision, you act upon it, and, and you might get married, you might break up once you make that decision, but once you are done evaluating, dating should be over, and, and the decision should be made one way or another, yay or nay. Um, dating is for evaluating a potential spouse. That implies you should only date people that you've prayerfully decided that you think you could see yourself marrying. Now, the next word I want to highlight in that is the word prayerfully, okay? Ask God to give you eyes to see things from his perspective. Trust that God knows best. Your feelings don't always know best. You're going to feel infatuated when you're in the dating stage, right? Um, Humble yourself at this time and ask for not only advice, but yield to what you know is godly, okay? Um, God... Um, has things written in scripture, principles that we can apply. So if you're thinking about dating someone and you know you would be breaking something in scripture in order to do that, you had best not date that person. You best not ask that person on a date. Now, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, we are to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And he's talking about God providing everything that we need in order to live. And some of you think that you need a relationship in order to live. And if you really think that you need a human relationship in order to fill your deepest longings, um, then this talk isn't for you. Actually, then you, you need to go back to square one because you don't have a good understanding of the benefits of a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus. Um, you need to long for something better if you think that your deepest longing is going to be fulfilled by a human earthly relationship. And so Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is saying, this is Jesus saying that earthly things will not fill a spiritual God-sized hole in your life. And we have to understand that. Um, our deepest longings aren't going to be fulfilled by human relationships, food, pleasure, accomplishments. Uh, None of these things are going to fill a God-sized hole in your life, and therefore, you can't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, you should be, now I'm talking about you, before you even enter, before you ever enter into a dating relationship, you should be coming into that relationship as someone who is whole and complete in Jesus Christ, and you have everything that you need in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, it's a game changer to be able to come into a relationship 
uh, being whole and complete and not having to depend upon fallible human beings because they're going to let you down eventually. So let me tell you, when you put your identity in the rock solid foundation of Jesus Christ, um, you are protecting yourself from being shaken at every wind and wave that comes at you, which includes a dating relationship, the ups and down of dating. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that Kate and I's relationship, it has always felt so safe uh, because we didn't have our identity in the other person or in the relationship. Our identity was in Christ, and it was unshakable. And so, therefore, whatever happened in our relationship, we knew um, who, who we were. Uh, we were not two halves becoming a whole, like the cliche says. We were two whole people coming together to evaluate whether or not we wanted to marry each other. So, enough about um, what is dating. Let, let's move now from checking ourselves before we date to who do we date? That's, that's an equally valid question. Leads my, right into my next point. I've spoken enough about ourselves. Who do we date? You should be looking for someone else who's whole and complete in Jesus Christ. Amen? If, uh, if, if you are dating someone who has a God-sized hole in their life, and they're expecting you to fill it, you are going to fail at that every single time. And that unmet, unattainable expectation that they have for you, then when you don't fulfill that, it's going to create brokenness and conflict in your life. Both of your lives. So, talking about prayerfully picking someone who I knew was whole and complete in Christ, I'll tell you what I did before I started dating Kate, before we ever went on a single date, before I ever called her, it was around December of last school year that um, I felt like God was just putting it on my heart, Kate Gardner. And I, um, it's funny, uh, I, was, I was thinking about her for three months. I prayerfully considered uh, basically whether or not I could see myself marrying her. And uh, this was before I ever asked her on a date notice. I was thinking about that before I ever asked her on a date. It's not worth dating someone who you don't think you could ever marry. Now, I knew that Kate was a godly woman. Um, she had baptized friends. She had started Bible studies. She had gone on mission trips. She had lived in the girl's house, you name it. And I ended up having peace knowing that I was going to ask out a godly woman who was whole and complete in Christ. Now, a few months ago, when I asked Kate's mom for her blessing and me asking Kate to marry me, um, her mom told me the story of when I did call her to ask her on our first date, uh, Kate came upstairs and was jumping up and down and was so excited uh, to go on a date with Ike Sheehan, and who wouldn't be? But, um, but uh, nonetheless, the reason that she was excited was because she told her mom that she thought I was someone who she could see herself marrying. I was the type of guy that she, she had stored in her brain from knowing me in college that she could see herself marrying. She was excited for that. And so I want to talk about um, asking out a godly person. Second Corinthians, I think the slide says first Corinthians, but second Corinthians uh, 6, 14 says, do not, Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, remember from earlier this semester, I preached a sermon that I had this picture of a yoke um, so we've talked about a yoke this year. You know that that's, um, that's something that is expressed as you're being, you're being attached to someone else. Paul is saying, don't attach yourself to a non-believer. Your lives are not heading in the same direction, okay? You, you don't want the same things. I, I already, I mentioned uh, that if you are truly a born-again believer, you, you want things that are of the Spirit. You don't want things that are of the flesh. Guess what an unbeliever wants? They want the things of the flesh, and they don't want the things of the Spirit. Your lives, you don't want the same thing, and your lives aren't heading in the same direction. So Paul does not approve of the whole flirt to convert idea, okay? You do not. Guys, I don't care how hot she is. If she's not a Christian, I'm being serious when I say you don't ask her on a date. You don't date her. You don't yoke yourself with an unbeliever. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to not do that, period. And this is once again where I ask you, do you have the kind of uh, mental fortitude and, and conviction to follow Christ such that when you read something in Scripture, it's done in your life? You, 
you're, you're going to do it, you know? Do you have that kind of uh, conviction to follow Christ? Now, I'm going to assume most of us already knew that we should probably be dating believers. So now let's, let's talk about, let's assume you are thinking of dating a fellow believer. I would still tell you an, another step uh, toward evaluation is that maybe, maybe it's only wise to continue thinking that you should marry this person if your lives are headed in the same direction. Um, more practically speaking, um, make sure that you, uh, one of you doesn't want to be a missionary in Africa and the other one want to be an accountant in Fort Wayne, okay? Your lives are not heading in the same direction. You're still both following God. You're both seeking the kingdom. That's fine. Your lives just aren't heading in the same direction, and that's okay. You both know who you are in Christ. You can break the relationship off and, and be fine, okay? That, that's what I'm talking about, dating a believer. Now, the process of dating. I want to talk a little bit about the process of dating. How do you date is the question that I'm, I'm really trying to answer. The process of dating, write this down, should be as short as possible, but as long as necessary. As short as possible, but as long as necessary. Because dating is a process that you move through. It's not just a status to stay in. Your relationship should always be moving toward your final evaluation of whether, you know, yay or nay. Um, and so that's why it should be as short as possible. Now, to the long as possible, long as necessary part, this is a huge decision, who you're going to marry. This is, this is, you know, this is bigger than any other relational decision that you're going to make in your life. Um, when you want to make a new friend, they don't make you go to the courthouse and sign a friendship license. But when you want to get married, they make you go to the courthouse and sign a marriage license, okay? This is the biggest relational decision that you're going to make in your entire life, okay? Now, this is someone that you're going to become one flesh with, spend the rest of your life with, love unconditionally. Do you know that this is the person that you want to do that with? Now, let's say you have caught yourself a really good one here, and you know it, and, and you're going on dates, and you're just googly eyes for this person. And let me ask you, when you feel that way, how are you going to impartially and unbiased evaluate this person? Uh, how are you going to do that? Um, we're, we're talking about making a commitment for life. You, you can't make that decision based on feelings and infatuation. Um, so how are you going to do that? This is the problem that we face with society nowadays. You see, dating um, is really only about 100 years old. Um, before that, the, it was more so the family of each person had most of the decision and most of the responsibility of evaluating this potential spouse. And somehow, over the course of time, we, society, we as a society, as at least as a Western society, have handed off the responsibility of evaluating this person to you, the person in the relationship. It's like giving a toddler a blowtorch, that kind of responsibility. I don't know how we ever did that. But I might not be a genius, but I know enough to know that that has probably led to the increase in divorce rate in the last hundred years, you know? Um, now, girls, I can speak to you for a minute. You know who's going to be really helpful in the process of evaluation? You know who uh, isn't going to be feeling feelings of infatuation when trying to pick out your future spouse? Your dad. Yeah. <laughs> now, this goes for everybody. Talk to your families. Talk to your families about your spouse. Ask about what they see. Invite other people into this, even trusted just godly counsel or really trusted Christian friends. You have to believe that getting more eyes on this situation that you're in is worth it in the end because of how important marriage is and, and, and um, living a godly life through marriage. Now, um, besides just getting more eyes on the situation, I, I do want to mention, why not try to, in your dating relationship, do some activities where you really actually learn something about the person or uh, do something meaningful together. Why don't you be intentional with the time that you spend when you're together? Um, don't just do useless things because if you spend a bunch of time doing useless things that actually don't help you evaluate this person at all, you're dragging on the process of dating. Uh, Kate and I were always moving forward in our relationship. We, always, we almost always had in mind something that we could talk about next important in our relationship, evaluating the relationship. Where are we in the relationship? Um, evaluating each other. We almost always had something that helped us move forward because remember that dating is a process to move through. It's not just a status that you stay in. So if you reach a point, this is the not fun part. If you reach a point where you know, I don't want to marry this person, break it off. Okay. There's no shame in that. Like I said, um, 
just continue seeking the kingdom of God because if you're both whole and complete in Christ, then you'll be more comfortable letting each other go, knowing and trusting God with that person's life. You don't have to be the Lord of their life, nor should you be. Um, there's freedom that comes with two people who are whole coming together, evaluating, and making a decision. That, there's, there's freedom in that. You're not codependent upon each other. You're trusting the Lord in the breakup process as well. And um, trust is something that you have to do during that time. Uh, you don't have to force the relationship to go on further than it needs to be because you trust that your breakup, um, you deciding not to marry each other and deciding to move on with your lives, it can actually be a good thing for you. It can actually be a good thing for the kingdom of God. Um, so that's a little bit about the process of dating. This next thing that I want to bring in here and talk a lot about actually um, kind of goes along with the process of dating. It kind of runs parallel. It's, it's about boundaries in, in dating. And this is, this is something interesting. I think most people normally only think of physical boundaries when we think of boundaries in dating. I want to make an argument that there are emotional boundaries as well. There's, there's two kinds of boundaries, physical and emotional. And I think emotional is just as important. Um, emotional purity in a relationship, um, I think, is best understood maybe by this scripture, Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Ideally, when you're in a relationship, it shouldn't look like one person really trying to get a hold of the other person's heart and manipulate them into liking them back. Um, while the other person sits there and guards their heart from that person playing defense. Um, that's not what a relationship should look like. A relationship should look like not only two people guarding their own hearts, but actually guarding each other's hearts from contamination and sin and um, manipulation. So what does this mean? Be cautious and protective of the other person's emotions and feelings. Um, I liked Kate, and Kate liked me way more than we ever told each other for the first probably half of our relationship. Um, author Elizabeth Elliot, uh, she wrote a book, Passion and Purity. She says this, if your passions are aroused, say so to yourself and to God, and then hand the reins over to God. To go one step further, Kate and I, we had a conversation pretty early on in our relationship when we started to really feel passion for each other. And this conversation was about using the word love. And I felt convicted that uh, using the word love in a romantic sense, especially in a Christian relationship, it should refer to the kind of love that's unconditional and committed. And so this led Kate and I to feel comfortable in coming to a decision that we weren't going to tell each other that we loved each other until we were ready to marry each other. And we did just that. And so the first time I ever told Kate I loved her was seconds before I asked her to marry me. And she said yes. So it worked out pretty well. And we, we both even to this day actually look back on that and really agree that like that's, that's something that we are uh, happy that we did. Um, and so when I, I just want to say when I read the word love in the Bible, I don't hear it referenced when referred to someone going on a couple dates with someone, and then they break it off and, you know, whatever. And they keep using the word with other people and other people. In a romantic sense, man and woman, in the Bible, I read the word love, and it normally uh, refers to, for example, in Paul in Ephesians 5, a husband laying down his life for his wife, and his wife fully submitting everything to her husband. Um, marriage is a really good thing, but it's not meant to be imitated when you're just dating. Uh, don't pretend to be married when you're not. I know that you love the idea of being married and you love it so much that you want to pretend that you are. I'm here to tell you, you're actually devaluing marriage when you do that um, because you're trying to mimic marriage without actually committing to the person. And so if you want to be married, put a ring on it and get married. That's awesome. I'm here for it. Commitment is good. Let me tell you this. Uh, talking about emotional boundaries, um, the closer you get to someone, emotionally speaking, the more vulnerable, you know, the more you share life with each other, um, the more likely you are to get hurt if things either go south or really just in, in the sense of a relationship, you're going to get hurt all the time anyway. I shouldn't say all the time, but uh, you're going to get hurt anyway. And the closer you get, the more hurt there is, uh, the more opportunity for, there, for that there is. So it, I have a passage here from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it's said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, Paul here, he's talking about this in the context of sexual immorality, physically speaking. <clears throat> I'm not specifically talking about physical uh, here. I'm talking about emotional intimacy. And I, I actually do think that um, when, you, when you share so much life together, when you become so vulnerable and become so emotionally attached to someone, there is a sense in which you are creating a bond with that person. And if things break off, you're ripping off that bond. Think about two becoming one flesh and then tearing it off again. That's basically what Paul is saying, uniting with a prostitute and tearing it off again. And, and I want you to imagine uh, things don't work out with you and Cindy, so then you go on, move on over to Sally, and you create a bond, and then you rip it off, and you go and try, you know, dating a bunch of other people and you create a bunch of emotional bonds and keep bonding and ripping and bonding and ripping, that is not a good cycle. And that is not how God intended our hearts uh, to be guarded, as Proverbs says. So you should tremble at the thought of doing this tearing and ripping to one of God's children. You should tremble at the thought of doing that. I want you men, think about how protective dads are of their little girls, right? Now, I want you to think about this. That's a sinful man who's not even capable of loving his daughter 1% as much as God does. So why would you willy-nilly, unprayerfully get into a relationship with one of God's daughters? You know, it's a serious thing to get into a relationship with one of God's daughters. Now, physical boundaries. This is the one we normally think of. Um, I want to read some passages together and compare here. Ephesians 6, <clears throat> Paul talking about the literal devil and his literal army. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, the ESV has wrestling with, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil. He's talking about, you know, wrestling with the devil. You know, that, that's what we have to do, Paul says. When talking about sexual immorality, Paul, Paul says what? Just flee. Just flee from sexual immorality. Flee from desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, why is it that referring, when, when referring to the devil, he's, he's talking about we, we wrestle with him, we put on the armor, and we go to battle with him. When he talks about sexual immorality, it's better off if you just get out of there. I, mean, I think there's a reason for that. I think the more you wrestle with your sexual impulses, that's just a losing battle. And I think Paul is, I think Paul is spelling that out in the New Testament. Don't even bother asking God to give you strength to withstand um, putting yourself through sexual temptation. If you're going to put yourself in a t situation with someone of the opposite sex in which you're tempted, don't even bother asking God to help you withstand that because he already told you to flee from it. Wh what are you trying to withstand? You're supposed to be fleeing. You're asking God to give you the strength to do something he already told you not to do, right? So practically speaking to, to our lives, don't spend significant amounts of time alone with the opposite sex when you're in a dating relationship with them. Don't stay in an empty house together or apartment together. Don't go in the bedroom and talk behind closed doors. Don't um, go spend a bunch of time in a car. Don't have a late night movie session. If you think a late night movie session is just going to end with you guys talking about cinematography, I don't know what kind of experience you've had with the opposite sex, but that doesn't happen normally. So, I pose this question. What if you were actually just as pure as possible? What if you were actually just as pure as possible? What if there was no funny business trying to get as close to the line as possible without going over? I've been there, guys. I was wise in my own eyes once. And a way that Travis, uh, a couple of years ago, talking about sex and purity, he here at T&W, the way he talked about purity once was that purity is not just a line in the sand that you try to get as close to without actually crossing. That's, that's not the idea of purity. The idea of purity is actually just heading in a direction. What's the most pure? I'm going to go in that direction. So does that make sense? A true Christian is not asking, how much can I get away with without sinning? That's not the idea of purity. 1 Timothy 
5, verses 1 through 2, <clears throat> Paul is writing to Timothy, Don't rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Okay, as if he were your father. Like a, he, He's using a simile here relating to a family member. Let's see where Paul goes with this here. Older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. You know, in God's eyes, everybody is just either a brother or sister in Christ until you're married. Then you are husband and wife. You are one flesh in God's eyes. But until then, you're a brother and sister in Christ. And there's no covenant made before God in a dating relationship. You're not one flesh in a dating relationship. The Bible does not make a category for dating relationship. You are either husband and wife or um, brother and sister. So you say, and you see how in this text, the word, the word purity even pops up again. We, we're, that's what we're talking about, purity here. And so you say, well, that sounds radically different than what I've been told dating is like. Yeah, welcome to Christianity. Yeah, remember the whole cost of discipleship section here, um, that whole dying to yourself part, the, the losing your life for Jesus' sake. Yeah, that comes back. Yeah, yeah. It takes, it takes a kind of, now let me tell you this, you're not missing out on what the world has to offer when, when, you, when you pursue a relationship with absolute purity. Some, some people think, well, it sounds like I'm missing out on a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff. It takes a lot of trust to trust uh, that purity like this could still lead to joy. Um, holiness will always lead to joy. True purity doesn't think about how much they can get away with. True purity doesn't worry about how much can I do without it being a sin. No. I want to talk about something else that's costly in the Christian life and especially dating life. Christians shouldn't dress in such a way that's provocative or would cause someone to lust after you. Now, of course, the person who is doing the lusting is responsible for that. But you might be setting the trap for them. You might just be putting them on the altar of their own sins that they're going to be sacrificed on. But I'm going to say it. Us men, um, we have a stronger sexual desire for women than women do for men. And I don't know if that's news for many of you. That was news for me this year. I probably learned that just a few months ago. And so I went my whole life not really knowing that just like men seem to be more attracted to women than physically speaking than women are to men. And so, I mean, Kate told me that a while ago. Not not everybody feels this way. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, and I went, I went almost my entire life not knowing that. But I bring it up. The reason I bring this up is because, honestly, women, I want to talk to you, we're attracted to you enough, as is. You don't have to egg it on by wearing something really revealing. And I have a a verse here that I want to read. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Peter says, your beauty, he's talking to women here, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, It should be that of your inner self. Your beauty should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That's where your beauty comes from. No, he's not not condemning elaborate hairstyles or anything. He's saying your beauty comes from an inner kind of beauty, unfading, he says. Now, women, I want to give you the perspective of a Christian man in college. I remember in college when I was single, what I thought of, how women dressed sometimes. And sometimes I would see a really beautiful girl who was just wearing something so revealing and provocative that basically I actually was turned off by that. I basically knew that's not a girl I'm going to pursue. And so I just want to share that with you girls. Maybe you, I don't know, I don't know, maybe some of you um, need to hear that. But now men, about the same topic, (laughs) our sexual passions and desires, um, we have to put that under the authority of Christ and crucify ourselves every day. I have a quote here from author Elizabeth Elliot in her book, Passion and Purity. She says, it's the control of passion, not its eradication, that's needed. How would we learn to submit to the authority of Christ if we had nothing to submit? She's saying, your desire is not a bad thing in itself. It's the uncontrolled nature of it that's a bad thing. It might actually be controlling you more than you are it. Um, so submit to Christ everything and, and just die to yourself every day. What happens too often, and this is, this is the story of some of some relationships that maybe you've been in, maybe you haven't, but, um, 
the man who has a greater physical sexual desire, um, he tries to push the boundaries of the, of the relationship basically as far as the woman will let him go until uh, then it's, it's understood that it's her responsibility to say no enough at some point, and then that's where the line is drawn, and you just tiptoe around that line for your whole relationship until you fall or whatever, and that's, that's not purity. I want to I wanna talk to the men. Men, what if we led a relationship in purity? You know, I learned this year also from a mentor of mine who's older than me. He's been married probably almost 20 years. Um, he told me that women are at their best when they feel safest. And, and I think we should take that seriously. What if men led the relationship in purity? How different would that look? And then finally, a point on physical uh, boundaries. Physical, uh, getting physical actually hinders your ability to evaluate whether or not you should marry this person. Totally blinds your vision, totally gets you way more uh, bonded with that person than you should be at that point in your relationship. And so it actually, you're, you're doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing, which is evaluating. So all that, I'm going to end my sermon. This has been really long, but I'm going to end my sermon <coughs> by saying, basically, you're sitting out there and you're thinking, boy, I've I've messed up. My, my significant other and I have messed up. And that might be really real for some of you. And I want to talk to you. Um, if, if you hear something and you're convicted of it, what do you do? What do I do now? The first point I have is just repent before the Lord. And this doesn't have, God is, God is, yes, a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy. Um, the book of, the book of James talks about how if you've broken even one law, you're guilty of breaking all of the laws. Yet right after, as hopeless as that sounds, right after he says that, he spells out how uh, mercy actually triumphs over judgment in God's kingdom. God is a God of mercy. Just go to the Lord and repent. Uh, and then once you have repented before the Lord, go and repent to your significant other and make it right with them and apologize for just not loving them as a brother or sister in Christ correctly. And then from that point, communicate how you're going to fix this, and do this at all costs. Remember the whole cutting off your hand, plucking out your eye thing? If you're going to have a Christian relationship, you should be willing at all costs to do whatever it takes not to sin in your relationship. And um, that's what I suggest for if you're sitting out there and you realize that um, we have some work to do if we need our relationship to, to look more like what uh, the Bible spells out we should look like. So, I include that at the end because I, I'm not here to, to bash anybody over the head with a Bible and tell you that you're going to hell. But we as Christians should have a dating relationship that looks different than the rest of the world. And so I hope that this was helpful for doing that. Um, I want to pray for each and everybody here tonight. And so would you join me as I, as I finish with a word of prayer? Uh, Father God, I pray that your word tonight has... Um, hopefully spoken to each and every one of us in such a way that we can take uh, your principles into our dating and, and love life. And so, Lord, I, I pray that um, relationships between men and women uh, look different in the context of our CCH community. And I pray that um, you would be honored and even glorified by um, how relationships are done um, in our CCH community. I pray for people here who maybe need to um, fix some things and repent. Um, Lord, I, I pray that uh, you'd, you'd give them the courage and the strength to do that. And uh, yeah, God, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Um, Lord, we often are wise in our own eyes, and I repent of that, and, and we all do. Um, so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would forgive us of our sins. Um, and, Lord, tonight, I pray that we would turn a new leaf um, in our relationships and the way that we view dating and dealing with the opposite sex. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, um, we don't have family group questions tonight. I uh, thank you guys for hanging in there for a long sermon, but we now have uh, an announcements video for you guys. So look at the screen for important announcement video. <laughs>
We never saw it coming. It was like they knew we were here. Never ending terror, running, and hiding. All for what? Do you know what I've been through? Hours and hours of being chased we have to work together. Don't you think I know that? I know what must be done. I just don't know if I have the courage to do it. Let's go, get out of here, go, go! Well, if you're a freshman, you may have no idea what you just witnessed. And so Mikey's going to come up front here, and he's going to explain more about humans versus zombies. Yeah, so humans versus zombies is a week-long game of tag here on campus through April 8th through the 12th. And basically, it's just a week of getting to meet new people on campus, making your week a little spicier, like a, like a recipe and all that stuff. You get to add a little spice to it. But just a good way to meet new people, hang out, have some fun, get to run around campus, exercise a little bit, throw socks at people. And I'm not the only other person running it. Uh, Alex is in the back over there. He's also a mod. Morgan up here. Matt over here. And where's the other Matt? Way up there. So we're the moderators in charge of the game this year. If you have any questions, you can direct it towards us. But if you haven't signed up yet, the QR code is right behind me. Scan the QR code to sign up. There's a few meetings next week to get more information about the game, being rules, getting your zombie ID or human ID is the same thing, and your bandana to play. But I encourage you all to play it. If you still question it, just sign up because you have to attend the meetings to actually play the game. So just consider it, think about it, but it's a great game on campus, and I encourage you all to play it. Thank you. Thanks, Mikey. Two more things for our evening together. Um, if you are going to be living in this area this summer and you're like, I have no idea where to live, but I have an internship within the driving distance of Angola, um, we have some summer housing applications on the table in the back. Um, our girls' house and guys' houses typically are opened up in the summer, um, assuming we have enough people apply. Um, but if you need housing for the summer, check that out. It's probably cheaper than getting housing somewhere else. And you get to live at CCH houses, which is cool. Um, and then next week, Ike said we were talking about sex next week. That's not true. Marty Solomon is going to be here next week. So if you're, like, wondering who Marty is, just talk to Lance. Lance could probably tell you his entire life story in detail. So, um, But Marty will be here next Tuesday night to share with us, um, talk more about how scripture can be dug into deeper and then he'll have some stuff on Wednesday also, and we'll be around campus and eating in the cafeteria with us and things like that. So Marty Solomon next week, summer housing in the back, and scan the QR code to sign up for Humans vs. Zombies. Have a great night, guys.